Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Greg, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be back at this fantastic event, albeit in a virtual sense. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to talk to you today about the Argyle Diamond Mine closure. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm calling from today, the Wadjuk people of Perth, Western Australia, as well as the Gidja and Miriwong people of the East Kimberley, whose land the Argyle Diamond Mine is situated. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I've been fortunate to spend time on country with the, the Gidja and Mirurung people over the past two and a half years working at Argyle, learning about their culture, how they use their land and what their expectations are for closure. There have been difficult conversations along the way, but they form a really important part of the journey towards closing with pride and successful relinquishment and personally has provided me with a greater sense of purpose and an alternate perspective on the work we do. So in today's presentation, I, I hope to provide an overview of the, the closure at, at Argyle, uh, summarise uh, the status and challenges faced from a contaminated site's perspective and the approaches undertaken, um, summarise the transition from operations to closure and how the contaminated sites process aligns with other aspects of my enclosure. I'll also discuss the importance of community consultation and reflect on some of the opportunities for progressive closure outcomes. So the Argyle Diamond Mine, um, for those of you unaware, is, is located approximately two hours um, south by car um, of Kununurra um, and approximately 35 kilometres southwest of, of Lake Argyle in the East Kimberley region of Western Australia. The mine's located on a approximately 60,000 hectare lease with a disturbed footprint of around 15,000 hectares. It's a really important story place for the Gidja and Mirawang people. And there are a number of registered heritage sites within the lease area and close to historical operations. So mining operations commenced in, in the mid eighties uh, initially focused on alluvial mining along smoke and limestone creeks, um, shown by the yellow areas in the in the right hand image. A few years later, um, open pit mining of the main Argyle Kimberlite commenced. And from 2013 onwards, it became an underground block cave mining operation. In terms of infrastructure, the, the main process plants and ancillary buildings are, are located between the open pit, waste rock dumps and, and tailing storage facility um, in, in the bottom left of the, the right hand image there. There are also three main water management dams associated with recent operations, uh, an airport, an associated fuel farm, uh, and a standalone alluvials process plant and tailings dams um, approximately 10 kilometres from the main or most recent operational area. So mining ceased in November of last year, which was followed by approximately six months of make safe activities, which essentially removed the, included the removal of unfixed hazmat, uh, de-energisation of re redundant services, and sailing and repurposing of as much residual plants, machinery and equipment as possible. In June this year, we entered into the closure execution phase, which is expected to take approximately four years to complete. Uh, this will primarily involve the demolition of infrastructure, uh, remediation of contaminated sites, water management, um, landform reshaping of the, the TSF waste rock dump and, and broader site area and revegetation. We're then anticipating a minimum of 10 years post-closure monitoring prior to relinquishment. The, the land will be relinquished back to the state with the intention that the future land users will be the traditional custodians of the land, the Gidja and Mirawong people, uh, with the post-closure land use intended to be pastoral, uh, continued cultural and spiritual use, as well as supporting cultural tourism opportunities. So at the point of commencing the feasibility study, um, there are a number of, number of challenges that need to be overcome. And this is a point in time where, where I, um, I transitioned into my role um, at, at Rio Tinto. 
So the entire lease was was and still is classified as possibly contaminated investigation required under the WA contaminated sites framework. And 48 areas of potential concern had been identified in a PSI from 2011. These areas of potential concern included your typical mine infrastructure, uh, process facilities, waste rock dump and tailings dams, as well as ancillary infrastructure such as bulk fuel storage, uh, fire training areas, workshops, power stations and landfills, etc. Some limited investigations had been undertaken throughout operations to address some of the high risk areas. However, the focus of these investigations was very much around the operational due diligence rather than meeting any closure reclassification objectives. Um, furthermore, some of some key contaminants such as at PFAS were yet to have been considered in these assessments. And I think the, the level of effort required for closure focused and audited assessments was not really fully understood um, by the team. I think these these challenges, um, as long as, as as well as other issues such as such as COVID nineteen, um, ongoing operations, and strict financial approvals processes at Rio Tinto, led to a challenging eighteen months or so of aggressive investigations to enable business decisions to be made and approved on schedule. The business intention was to progress straight through from final study phase into execution with a short, around six month um, period of developing and awarding major contracts. The images on the slide show the areas of potential concern that were, were identified across the main area of disturbance. And for scale, it's approximately 16 kilometers from the landfill to the very south of the image, um, to the airport, at top of the, end, top of the airport to the north. So there was initial pressure from the business to scale up quickly to support feasibility study estimates, designs and execution contracts. So establishing the project team early in the feasibility study and aligning on objectives was critical. I think if the, if the project team hadn't been, had, had been established any later, I think there would have been serious challenges in delivering the contaminated sites aspect of the study on schedule. Uh, and to be honest, we weren't really at an executable level of design when we wanted to have been. This might not sound like a significant issue in the whole context of closure, um, but could have contributed to a number of adverse events such as delay in commencement of execution, uh, delay of traditional owner business engagement, and potentially the loss of project team and knowledge given the current state of the, uh, the market. Uh, key risks, actions and controls were, were documented in the project risk management system to communicate to the, the immediate team, but also to the wider business. Uh, a roadmap was developed and agreed for the feasibility study, but also taking into consideration the overall closure roadmap and, and detailed gap analysis undertaken. Given the magnitude of works ahead and the urgency to provide greater certainty to the business, Investigations were split into two main pre-execution phases. The first phase was to focus on high priority areas, as well as to establish site-wide baseline conditions. And the objective of this first phase was to inform and study estimates um, to the satisfaction of internal stakeholders, whilst establishing data gaps requiring further investigation as part of order to endorse sampling, uh, sampling plans. Priorities were established by assessing each of the areas of potential concern against a number of agreed factors such as risk, stakeholder, opportunities, accessibility and efficiency. So this diagram shows how the contaminated site process fits into the overall closure process um, in the Argyle example. So with mine closure plans being developed every three years and closure studies commencing approximately 10 years from closure, depending on the size of the operation. Uh, often there are different teams and consultants involved in mine closure plan development and also feasibility study evolution, 
which can lead to inconsistencies in how information is presented and how data is assessed. So it's important to have the right team established uh, and be fully aligned. Uh, from what, I, what I've learned, you know, the, the closer you get to closure and implementation, the more that these inconsistencies can become evident due to the greater scrutiny on delivery and the development of execution contracts. At Argyle, the, the, the closure focused contaminated sites assessments didn't really commence until the feasibility study stage. Now, this might be okay for small, low complexity sites, but as we all know, developing a robust conceptual site model and risk assessments can take a number of years to achieve, particularly when seasonal baseline data um, and extensive community consultation is required. So we're currently at the phase now where we've, we've got developed two preliminary site investigations, uh, one for the main operations area, uh, but also another to support the reclassification of a wider lease area. Uh, four closure-focused detailed site investigation reports have been prepared, a number of risk assessments, and an order to approve the remediation action plan. I think the most technical and, and time-consuming component so far has been a human health and environmental risk assessment for PFAS. Um, this assessment included the, the sampling of cattle serum uh, from cattle on the existing pastoral lease, bush tucker identified by traditional owners, and multiple fish sampling events from nearby creek systems, as well as undertaking robust community consultation. I think going forward, I suspect and, and, and certainly recommend that there should be an increased focus on ensuring that you know, operational monitoring is, is more considerate of contaminated sites requirements. Um, this has the potential to increase the effective of those operational assessments and um, deliver greater value. Um, opportunities for progressive closure should be assessed throughout the life of mine. Um, and the, the project team should be established early in the study phase to identify risks and opportunities early, assist with internal and external consultations, and develop objectives and assessment roadmap. The preliminary site investigation should be kept up to date and endorsed by the auditor prior to feasibility study. Um, and closure-focused contaminated sites assessment should in my view, be commenced earlier around the, the, the PFS stage, um, possibly earlier depending on the extent of expected impacts or options in terms of progressive closure outcomes. So the, the WA Mine Closure Planning Guidelines uh, have, a, have a brief paragraph dedicated to contaminated sites, um, which are I find can lead to the perception that it's a small component of the overall closure process and can often get overlooked during initial planning phases. Uh, however, a lot of organisations are quickly finding that this is often not the case, uh, particularly as, as reclassification is an essential part of the relinquishment process. Furthermore, I don't think it's widely accepted and appreciated amongst wider industry that the term contaminated sites professional is, is a pretty broad term for the collective of multiple specialist fields. And that the specialists within those fields can add significant value to, to other areas of the mine closure process. From my experience working across asset closures, not just in, in mining is that you know, a wide range of environmental investigations are often completed to support closure plans um, and, and other operational, operational requirements. And, and these assessments often overlap in discipline, but uh, they're not always strategically aligned and can be too independent of each other. Uh, a few examples that may be used to support mine closure are, are presented on, on the slide. I, I won't um, talk through them all, but all of these need to be aligned with and considered as part of the contaminated sites. Um, assessment process. And, and many can actually be completed by specialists within that contaminated sites bucket of experts. 
I think it's really important to clearly map out the closure assessment strategy uh, with clearly defined inputs and outputs and identify synergies between these assessments. And failure to do so can lead to inconsistency, low regulator confidence, and also significant realignment um, requirements late in the closure process. The, the I say ICV, the contaminated sites framework, um, has been a really useful tool to connect and conceptualize risk from multiple technical studies. And through this integration, there's, there's an opportunity to refine completion criteria and ensure that remediation and management meet several closure and post-closure land use objectives. So one example of where the mine closure plan for Argyle didn't really, or didn't initially consider the contaminated sites process was in relation to defining completion criteria or heavy metal concentrations in fish, and, and specifically the requirement for heavy metal concentrations to achieve Australian and international food standards. So the problem with using these guidelines as a, as a generic completion criteria is that there are no direct comparison criteria for most of the, the metals um, that we've, we've been assessing for requiring further assessment to be undertaken in order to establish those criteria. Uh, the exposure scenarios are not necessarily consistent. Um, we also had no explanation in our supporting documentation as to how the data would be collected or assessed, um, i.e. whether what fish species are we targeting, are we assessing whole fish, fillets, uh, statistical approaches, etc. And what it actually means if we fail any of these criteria. It was also inconsistent with the approach taken for other consumption assessments, such as the PFAS assessments for completed specifically for contaminated sites. This also further demonstrates the importance of a collaborative approach to develop, de developing completion criteria, rather than progressing assessments and reports in isolation. At uh, the point of execution, completion criteria and the method of data assessment should be as prescriptive as possible, uh, following the SMART principle, um, not just referring to a guideline. I think this is important because default guideline criteria may already be exceeded um, and may not be achievable based on current closure designs. Um, this presents a risk to the overall relinquishment possibility and, and also timing. So community consultation um, it's, it's a critical aspect of closure. Um, regular community consultation, consultation session, sessions are held um, via quarterly committee meetings, and these aim to provide updates around closure-related activities, uh, performance against management plan agreements, and respond to any questions raised by the communities. Um, other consultations are undertaken as required to discuss specific aspects of closure. And key consultations earlier this year involved meeting with community members to provide an overview of initial findings in relation to PFAS, as well as obtaining information from traditional owners about how they use the land, where they fish, how often and at what times of the year. We also discussed methods of food preparation to ensure that sampling methods were appropriate and also discussed what fish are definitely not eaten and this last point is really important as, as using irrelevant data may lead to an under or overestimation of risk. And to be honest, it wasn't something that we had considered until undertaking these consultations. The findings of the consultation were used to develop plausible and implausible um, scenarios and input parameters for the tier three risk assessment, whilst including a healthy level of conservatism. This approach was then adopted for consistency when developing the metals criteria for mine closure plan compliance. As part of Argyle's closure, we, we also have six traditional owners that have been supported through their Cert 4 in, in land management and have been recruited by Rio Tinto as environmental rangers to support closure. Um, 
Rio Tinto and our, our assessment consultant, Cardno, are also in the process of delivering a contaminated sites program to the rangers by office-based learning modules and in-field practical sessions. The intention is that the rangers will progressively take on more responsibility for environmental monitoring as closure, pro as closure progresses. So the findings of a risk assessment supported by um, the community consultation uh, sessions and outcomes has helped to derive a short-term reclassification boundary of not contaminated unrestricted use for approximately 85% of the lease area, which we're currently in the process of seeking um, through submission of a mandatory auditor's report to the regulator. So this is the area between the, the black line and the red line red lease boundary on the on the image. Ongoing sampling is scheduled throughout closure execution and post-closure monitoring phases to monitor the risk profile over time. And further refinements of the classification boundary may be undertaken in the future once remedial works are complete. This reclassification not only provides assurance to stakeholders well in advance of full closure, but it also significantly reduces overall the costs incurred by Rio Tinto. So finally, I just wanted to share some key considerations for a successful asset closure. Now, most of these will, will appear obvious. Um, I'm not going into too much uh, technical detail, but with the pressures of agile delivery, often with tight timeframes and, and multiple internal teams, it can be really easy to lose focus on the basics. So for me, firstly, is the establishment of a core team of assessor, auditor, and owner's team. Now, obvious, I hear you say, but selecting the right team with a balance of technical delivery and strategic direction is, is paramount to success. Um, and once this team is established, a collaborative approach should be taken to the development and alignment of closure objectives and developing an assessment roadmap that sits for wider project objectives and timeframes. Offers, often, um, owners' teams can be guilty of putting too much of a, a barrier between the project and the consultant, and, and even between the consultant and the auditor, but a Rio tends to recognise the importance and value of an open dialogue approach. Progressive closure opportunities should be assessed during operations phase, but also extending into execution. This can assist to reduce the overall risk and liability progressively, rather than trying to manage all aspects after the completion and cessation of mining. Undertaking early and progressive community engagement is critical and should involve subject matter experts in the mapping and delivery of that process. Now, community consultation is, is critical for developing robust and representative risk assessments, as well as truly understanding stakeholder expectations for closure. Being transparent with findings and approaches and providing regular updates can help to build trust, which is particularly important when navigating an emotive topic such as contaminated sites. Integrating the contaminated sites framework with the mine closure planning process and oh, I've got a restart on my computer that wants to restart, but we'll postpone that. Uh, so yeah, integrating the um, contaminated sites framework with the mine closure planning process and utilizing this framework for the development of completion criteria ensures that there's a consistent approach uh, to the development uh, of completion criteria across the project. Uh, the robust variable auditing um, throughout the contaminated sites process provides that added assurance that completion criteria are technically sound. And finally, it's important to ensure that it's determined exactly what data will be collected in the future, how it will be assessed, what it will be assessed against, and documenting this clearly for future team and regulators alike. The potential consequence of poor planning and assessment is that relinquishment gets delayed, causing cost increases, damage and in the worst case scenario may even identify the closure designs are not suitable for achieving target outcomes 
it's much better to realize these early and manage and be caught out at the point of relinquishment. So I hope this presentation has provided a good overview of, of how contaminated sites fits into the, the mine closure process and the opportunities that are available and some of the considerations for, for future. Uh, happy to take questions at the end of the session or, or feel free to contact me outside of the forum. Thank you.